Welcome into 30 Minutes of Hell. Brought to you by Fail the 68 Network. The man, the myth, the legend, former Razorback, Blake Edens, joining me this week. Blake, I promise you it's not going to be hell. It may be a little, depending on how, how deep we get into it, maybe a little bit longer than 30 minutes. Well, I feel like I was about to say between the two of us, 30 minutes is, that's nothing. That's a break. <laughs> How's everything going? You look great. You look fantastic. I see in your suit there. Is that your office or you bought? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a side room at the office, um, kind of, kind of finishing the day up and, you know, anytime I can finish my day, uh, with Pat Bradley, uh, I'm here for it. If I didn't know any better, I, I would have guessed I was Governor Hutchinson's office. <laughs> His is a lot more ornate and, and, and elaborate. I think he's on, I think his his mugshot or or headshot is on is up there on one of the one of the composites behind me, but but no, no. As well it should be. And can I get this confirmed? Because the people, the people want to know, okay, as well as I do. Uh, do you wear uh, leather cowboy boots? To work every day. <laughs> With that so it's team. funny. You saw, you saw my tweet, uh, you know, and you know the story. Years ago when Coach Richardson was still um, not really wanted at Bud Walton Arena right after uh, he had been fired and, and may or may not have been in some legal tanglings with the university, uh, was was not really welcomed at Bud Walton Arena. I got in trouble. I used the word banned in my tweet. I had, had a couple – People ask if, you know, how legally binding that word was. And it's, I was like, it's a tweet. I'm just trying to tell a quick story. Um, I went out to Coach's Farm where you've been, you know, hundreds of times, Pat, and I had coffee the day of the game and just said, hey, you know, you're not allowed in Bud Walton Arena. You know, you've got all these boots. Let me borrow a pair of boots and, and I can get there early. You can't be in. Let's take a big part of you and I'll scuff the coach's box up like you used to do stomping and yelling at me and you, Pat, for not cutting, cutting off the baseline and, and other things like that. And, and just, you know, we love him. J just wanted to take a piece of him in. Absolutely. It was a big Kentucky game that day. Um, <clears throat> we, we go in his boot closet. He opens it up. They're just all kind of booty color style. A lot of red ones with razorbacks on the uppers. I had my eyes on those. And there was this one pair of white, lizard skin boots and 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 in my mind i'm like you know anything but that's it's it's those are the cousin eddie of it's cousin eddie cowboy boots. where it's tough to wear some pointy toed lizard skin cowboy boots that are white you know bud walton arena and you know coach like i know coach he's kind of talking about his boots and he goes you know what these remind me of you and he kind of winks and laughs and reaches for the one white pair of boots uh, and I'm not going to go into the jokes that we traded back and forth after that. Then he told the story about him. I think Miss Rhodes got him for him. Um, and look, their coach's boots. He ended up giving them to me instead of letting me borrow them. It was a special moment. Warm that day. We won. Uh, I've worn them to, I think, four games total. Uh, warmed another Kentucky game we won. And then I was courtside uh, for the Michael Qualls dunk. Uh, oh, yeah. Which is, you know, a historic moment. You can see me in the video, Pat. And, and the reason I, I you know, I would, I never, say, that I would never say that I, I'm not bragging that I was courtside. I'm explaining that I was courtside because when he dunks, I kind of jump, but you're in these white lizard skin boots. They're, they're kind of a narrow heel. You got to be careful. So I, I got about this high off the ground, which is, you know, my vertical's here. It's not impressive, but, but it's way better than here. And I've, I've been made fun of relentlessly by friends for years, but, but coach gave me those boots. It's a special thing. I've only bring them out. It's maybe the fourth time I've worn them, wore them this weekend. We won again, you know, JD Note played great. Jalen Williams is, is the heart and soul of that team. Stanley and Mude stepped up, but, but I think between me and you, I think we can be honest that it was, it was the boots that, that won the game. So. I get three things that stand out to me in that. Um, First of all, that you and Coach Richardson have the same size shoe. Which I didn't know. I didn't know. Like, I thought I would try them on and they wouldn't fit. They fit like a glove. It shocked me. And so that surprises me. Number two, well, I guess what, what also stands out to me is, for those who don't know, 
in your at Blake ends on Twitter. I saw that you were so close. I, it was almost as if Qualls was dunking on you, which is a, which is a feeling we both can relate to. Uh, having well, some, you know, I didn't. I uh, I was known for tackling people if they tried to dunk on me. Business uh, decision. Oops, I'll get out of the way. You either get out of the way, or or you, you catch him in midair and and go full Steve. And, and the third thing, I do like how you're blaming uh, Coach Richardson's cowboy boots for your lack of uh, verticality. They're all his fault. It's his all, fault. The, the, <laughs> it's got to be the boots. In the same way that the boots propelled us to victory. The boots held me back from, from showing off my true vertical. That's exactly right. Okay, so you were there. You still go to a lot of games, which is fantastic. I appreciate that. You know, everyone's so busy, but but you're able to keep a connection with everybody. Maybe that, you know, all of us can't get there. And, uh, you know, I'm currently on the East Coast and some of the – uh, You're big time now. You're a, you're a full-blown international TV personality. You're in the studio – you get a glimpse that none of us get. So those of us that, that don't have the chops that you have uh, get to go to the games in person. But I'll tell you, we love – there's nothing better than, than winning a big game and them going straight straight to you in the studio and, and we see the shoes and the pocket square. It, it's more of a pocket peacock. It's more of a thing. Yeah, it's um, so and, and there's nothing more that we love than, than, than to cut to Pat in the studio and we're proud of you. How we have how I haven't gotten boots to wear on set. We'll we'll think about that maybe for next season. And I want to talk obviously about your teams. You played with one of the greats of all time, but you were there on Saturday, Kentucky game. Currently, the Hogs. For those who who are viewing right now, this is the Monday after the Kentucky game. Currently, the Hogs are tied for 14th in the AP poll with Houston, 15th in the coaches poll. 23 in the net rankings, which have – I don't know if we figured that one out yet or not. I However, it sounds good. <laughs> Nobody wants me or you doing math, Pat. <laughs> that math is not what needs to happen today. But a real important one, our guy, Joey Brackets, Joe Lenardi, um, has the Hogs, I believe, a fifth seed currently right now. So just from – you you've been a, I think you've probably been to quite a few games this year. I, I know um, just from kind of chatting with you and, and seeing your Twitter feed. Uh, what has changed the trajectory of this team? Obviously, they were top ten ranked in the beginning of the year, which uh, the all preseason stuff. Who knows? But you've you've been able to see them up close through the beginning of the conference and then where they were on Saturday. What's been a couple of things that stood out to you that has made uh, that shift and now where we all feel pretty, pretty good about them making a run. Well, you know, first of all, let's go back to last year with Eric Musselman's team, you know, that, that Arkansas team kind of started off, not necessarily slow, but, but he was piecing it together and trying to figure out what his lineup was going to be at some new faces. Um, and, and as we see, he figured that out. Desi Sills got injured. Uh, Devo Davis was inserted into that kind of, you know, sixth, seventh man role. Uh, which grew as the season went and changed the trajectory of the season. Uh, Arkansas goes to the Elite Eight, has one of the one of the the, the best seasons in program history. Um, you know, fast forward to this year, a lot of new faces: Chris Like, Stanley Amude, Audis Tony. Um, you know, a, a few fre one freshman, a couple of folks that were sitting out last year. A lot of high expectations are coming off that Elite Eight. Um, Stanley Amude, the leading scorer, returning scorer in college basketball. You know, Eric Musselman, a, a great coach. You figure he's going to have it figured out day one this year as opposed to, you know, day 30. Uh, th this team really, the beginning of the year, struggled to, to, to get their chemistry going, struggled to figure out who was going to play what role. Uh, Debo was in that starting spot. Uh, and, and honestly, may have tried to do a little too much and played outside of his game some. I, th I think now you see him coming back into what he does best and and has helped propel this team. But but at times early in the season, it, it kind of – Arkansas was winning games, but it, it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right. And, and I know that that Coach Musselman and Coach Smart, Coach Arginal, uh, Coach Moser uh, had those same kind of feelings, and they're watching film – and you're getting some wins, but it doesn't quite feel right. And, and, and then you play Hofstra and Little Rock, and you lose to Hofstra. And, and that team that night looked like they had met in the parking lot for the first time before the game, 
and, and we've been there before. We, we played on AEU teams where five new dudes show up and everybody's switching jerseys and, and, and just couldn't quite figure out who was what. We had games for JD and Ote would come down and shoot five threes in a row. Um, before we move on, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet River Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up for Bet Rivers yet, now is the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their rush pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, it's more secure, and it's more reliable. Now that basketball season is tipping off, get in on the action at betrivers.com today or by downloading the Bet Rivers iOS app. You must be 21 years or older. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And while I got you here, let's talk about the Field of 68 Media Network, where college basketball matters most all year round. This is a digital media and podcast network that we've been building over the course of the last year. We have shows hosted by some of your favorite players covering the programs that they love the most. AJ Guyton hosts the House of Hoosier. Eric Devendorf covers Syracuse on the scorer's table. Dan Dickow hosts the Gonzaga Bulldog broadcast. We have Florida's Patrick Young and Duke's Andre Dawkins and North Carolina's Shimon Williams and Michigan's Stu Douglas and Illinois' Deion Thomas. The list goes on and on and on. We have more than 30 shows right now. So hit the links below and check them all out. And while you're at it, make sure that you go check out the Field of 12 Media Network, your home for college football. And that leads into my question, how in you, your years, 99, uh, your freshman year, 99, 2000, which was coincidentally right after my year, uh, and your, your senior year was 2002 to 2003, of course. A lot of, a lot, a lot of people forget I was supposed to be the next Pat Bradley. Um, that's how I was. I, actually, I was billed as a more a taller, more athletic version of Pat. <laughs> now, mind you, mind you, this better was, looking, better hairstyle, everything. This, this was six months after Pat broke the SEC three-point record. So taller, more athletic version of that guy. That's impossible. You're not going to – so that was – I was billed as that. I would do interviews and in that preseason before my freshman year as well. You're supposed to be Pat. And, you know, Pat's gone. You're going to fill it. You're the next Pat. And about three games into my freshman year, there were no more questions about <laughs> I, I never got the comparison again. So Bob Holt was not asking me, well, you know, they think you're the next favorite. What, what do you think? That was done. It was over. So was it a case of, hey, Pat would have ate the entire rack of ribs? Well, that was, that was one of the things, you know, Coach Richardson even had that story. Um, and that's what kind of spurned it all. I think we were at media days. And somebody was comparing me and coach said, Hey, when we had him out to the house, Blake ate, he said something, a ridiculous amount of wings that I, I didn't eat. I ate a bunch. I didn't eat that many. And he was like, <laughs> Pat did the same thing. So yeah, everything <laughs> they do is the same. He ate the whole thing. So it, uh, it, it really led into that, that kind of legend. And then three games in crickets, like, no. <laughs> well, you, you were, a, you were a player that, uh, you Auburn with Auburn roots. Your father played football there. Your both your brothers played football there. So you kind of had a a unique story where it was a, a late recruiting, which is similar to mine and, and similar to a, a, there's a lot of guys who sort of have that recruiting story. Matter of fact, there's a freshman right now that is an absolute stud for Tennessee, Zakai Ziegler, who I don't think was offered a scholarship by anybody until this this past summer before his freshman season. So you were somebody that um, kind of jumped on the scene similar to me right at the end of our high school careers. I think I signed in July. I was the last – I know I was the last Division I basketball scholarship to get signed. Wow. I remember I was the last scholarship in all of the Division I uh, full scholarship that year. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a – you know, I, I, I may not be on time – but I always, I always get there, Pat. I always, I always get there. So, yeah, there's no doubt you will. So, all right, going back to this Razorback team, and I don't know, like I'm watching this, and clearly to me, yes, the moves Coach Must made, Trey Wade. I think it, you know, he's a he's a great glue guy. He doesn't care about. He didn't have to shoot. Doesn't really. 
He's PJ no, Tucker. He's, he's the PJ Tucker of this team. He just wants to play defense, yeah. set good screens, get important rebounds. And if you leave him open, you know, he, he shoots a great now, now contested, maybe not. But if, if you just peel off, I think since he began or since he got broken the starting lineup, his open shots where, where these guys are helping off on JD or Jalen and he can kind of fade down to the wing or, or the corner. He, he shot a very high percentage from three, too. So he's kind of fit a kind of a bigger PJ Tucker role uh, for this team and, and a role that, that we didn't know we needed and, right. until he was inserted into the lineup. And he and Kamani Johnson changed the approach of this team. They played harder and they played tougher. And, and it, it kind of brought this team together uh, in a way that, that those of us that were at that Hofstra game and were at the Vanderbilt game did not see coming. We're happy. We're thrilled. Right. You know, genius move by, by Eric Musselman. Uh, great way to bring in the veteran Trey Wade and, and change the team, but it absolutely changed the trajectory of this season for Arkansas. You, you played with one of the greats and Joe Johnson and a lot of other talented guys, Brandon Dean, uh, Gibson, TJ Cleveland. Did you think, so at the beginning of this year, right, J.D. Note, or even last year, you watched J.D. Note's game, and he is six-man coming off the bench. You know he can score. He can get buckets quick. Everybody's throwing the volume shooter label at him. We hear everything. At the beginning of this year, you don't you, – you, you, you got Chris Likes and you got Devo Davis. So you're thinking, okay, J.D. Note – I'm going to be in the two guard position, off guard, shooting guard, whatever we call it these days. And now I said this on Saturday, this kid is the best conditioned athlete in the country. He's the primary ball handler. Like I'm watching this game against Kentucky Blake, JD Note is bringing the ball up against Ty Ty Washington. It's guys who are focused on making it difficult for him. He's a primary ball handler. He's the primary scorer in like, I never thought the, the solution to this would be JD Note plays point <laughs> and he's going to be our leading scorer. I just didn't envision that. I don't know if you saw that coming. I said on Saturday, he just showed he can play point guard in the NBA. He just showed he at six, three, maybe a little small for, you know, that off guard position, but he just showed me Saturday he can play point guard in the NBA. He put a lot of time in his conditioning this summer, lived in the weight room, uh, you know, was there, you know, two, sometimes three times a day, uh, which is a lot, uh, you know, more than once is a lot, but showing up that third time, getting shots up, working on his conditioning. I was at a handful of practices in the preseason and just to see how his body had changed and mm -hmm. the way he, he was just big boy and guys. Yeah, he's a strong kid. Preseason. Chris likes, didn't want none. I mean, it was he was absolutely big boy in life, but but you saw kind of a different player. And you go back to last year when he was the sixth man of the year, he was kind of more of a Vinny Microwave Johnson for, right. for, for those of us that grew up in you know eighties and nineties watching the Pistons play. Um, he was that guy that that came in off the bench, gave you instant offense, you know, hit a couple threes, got you sparked. He was he'd be in for six to eight minutes, and then he was coming back out, and they'd get a little more steady play out of somebody else. Um, you expected him to have a good season. Uh, maybe Chris Likes coming in from Miami was going to run the point. Devo was kind of transitioning into that starting point guard role. And, and you're right, he was going to be the off guard. Uh, but, but when they went with the Trey Wade, Kamani Johnson lineup, it was, you know, really, J.D., here's your, here is your tryout. Here's yeah. your chance to show us that you can be a pro, pro player, not, not just a scorer, not just a guy that can come in at a few shots. That, that you can log, you know, 36 minutes and have the best best guard on the other team guard you right. and then turn around and guard the best guard on the other team. And, oh, by the way, we're going to need you to score at least 20. <laughs> and he has done that done with, without without batting an eyelash from, from the second they insert him into that lineup. And he's doing it coming off of Jalen Williams, who's also become dangerous. That That's helped them. They can't completely commit every time uh, to, to J.D., but – but watching his maturation and seeing the player that he's turned, he's a great kid too. I mean, and, and that's another thing about this team that kind of shines through JD, Jalen, um, you know, Amude, uh, Tony, Trey Wade, they're, they're good kids. You, you, they're easy to root for, but, but JD especially. And, and I've been so proud as somebody that's watched him and watched his, his progress 
to see the player and the, and the guy that he's turned into leading this team. I think it was the ESPN National Player of the Week uh, this yeah, week. Yeah, it's just um, – I mean, like, it's filthy. Like, you played with uh, Joe Johnson, who was young and, and somewhat injured during his time. You guys still won the 2000 SEC turn, which is the only time – that the Razorbacks have won the SEC tournament. A lot of people are saying it's the proudest moment in the history of Arkansas basketball. <laughs> a lot of people. A lot of people. Only second to those leather white cowboy boots, sir. <laughs> um, I, I just – I don't know if you can think of any player who has really done so, – like, so – Jalen Williams, I, I want to get your take on him in a second, but J.D. Note, like leading the team in steals, I'm not saying he's the best defender on the team because, as you know, just because you can you know, get steals and play passing lanes and things like that doesn't necessarily make you a great on-ball defender, which I, you know, I think J.D. is. It's just tough for me to think. I mean, I know Mason Jones had a big season a couple of years back when he sort of uh, had some huge games. Um, but I don't know, it just feels where they are right now that um, even going back to last year's team, Moses Moody obviously was lottery pick and leading scorer. Uh, but, you know, having Tate and Smith and all those guys there, it just, uh, it just seems J.D. has got a lot of this just doing, producing so much from so many different levels, man. It's um, You just count on, you count on him. And, and that to me, you know, when you talk about a most valuable player, yeah. You know, it's not always the best player on the best team or what you talk about a guy that, that when he gets his second foul in the first half, you know, Razorback basketball fans are smart. We, we are a smart fan base when it comes to, to, you know, strategy and basketball strategy. And smart. So, and, and smart. Yeah, that too. That too. Um, <laughs> when JD gets his second foul in the first half, or Jalen gets his second foul in the first half, and you can hear the audible groans in in the audience and in the stands because you know that there aren't two guys in the country together that are as important to their team's success as as JD and Jalen, and 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 they kind of mix and match yin and yang and go together. Uh, you you can spell one or spell the other, but you look at Alabama. JD got two really quick fouls. He was on the bench, and and it was just a completely different team. He got to play more in the second half. Arkansas fought back, couldn't pull that out, and lost by one. But but two guys that are the absolute epitome of their team that, that you 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 just got to have them. If Arkansas yeah. is going to be make this run here at the end of the year, that they've got to stay out of foul trouble. And I, I think that stat. On, you know, you can do scoring, rebounding, blah, blah, blah. But if they stay out of foul trouble, this team wins basketball games, period. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Looking at even the top four or five teams in the league, they all have that great depth. And, and, they, and you're right, that's a good point about those two guys being so key. And Jalen, like Coach Moss, I think, has done a great job of his staff and developing those guys. And you can see Jalen Williams – like in his high school videotapes, how he had those instincts. Uh, we're doing a uh, sort of a special video breakdown for the SEC tournament for him. And I wonder, like, we both play for Coach Richardson, and we know how Coach, man, he, he loved those big guys. I almost feel like Jalen, like I see a little Oliver Miller in him sometimes, the baseball pass. And I'm sure you heard those stories of Coach Richardson, loved guys who'd step in and take charges, loved big men who could pass, soft hands. Um, what, does Jalen remind you of anybody that, or I mean, I know you've seen his progression um, from the past or anybody you can compare him to? He's, he's pretty unique. I mean, you see Flash is a big O. Just his court awareness from yeah. from you know when he gets that rebound, his back. Everybody else is running his back, but he he knows where his guys are, and his hips are turning as he hits the ground, and that ball's out, and, and it's it's to his guy on the break. You, you see flashes of that, but but Jalen, you know, in Arkansas basketball history, is is a unique individual, and and it's yeah. hard to put him, you know, into this bucket or or into this box or, or a straight up comparison to somebody from what he does is almost a point forward. JD gets it down, gets everything going, but 
you know, Jalen's coming up to the top, whether it's all the way outside the three point line or there in the free throw line, if they'll give him the free throw line, he'll take it and kind of condense the court a little bit, but it's running through Jalen. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember anybody and, and I'm going to get texts or calls and say, I'm an idiot, but I don't remember anybody that, that the offense was run through in this way uh, that, that was Certainly able Certainly not in the years that you and I, I mean, you could argue maybe before my time, I didn't play with a true big like that. I don't know if you did. I don't think we've seen one like him since you and I played prior to not us. That's killed, and that's not knocking anybody. Dwight out. Stewart. I don't know. Maybe guys like Dwight Stewart, guys like um, Oliver Miller. I'd have to go back and watch a lot more tape and understand. I mean, you know, Highland's putting in. You know, must would have him on there forty minutes. I mean, he's he's got to give him a break sometimes. So to to log the amount of minutes he's logging, to have the responsibility that he has not only on the defensive end. But but really, the offense is running through him. Right. Uh, and to also step up and take these charges. And you and I know, as somebody that, that we all try to take to draw fouls or have our little tricks of the trade, once you get that call a certain amount of times, the refs are kind of looking for it. They're kind of looking for it. So at this point in the season, to draw the amount of charges that he's drawn and continue to get them, they're looking for they're trying, they're looking for the flock. Rick Barnes complained. That's all he wanted to talk about after the game. Rick's a great guy. He's a wonderful man and a great coach. But he was so frustrated that Jalen was getting those calls. He was on the so, – so they're watching him now. So he has to draw a, 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 the most, you know, perfect charges there are now. Now he's going to get the benefit of the doubt also at times because he's so good at it. But, but to see his uh, progression this year, the same as, as J.D., and see the player he's turned into – uh, has been, you know, Jalen's been around the program since he was young, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in his teens, he's from Fort Smith right up the road. And he's always stood out. He's always been a big kid, but he's always kind of had that, that look. I mean, I mean, nobody looks like Jalen. Nobody looks like Jalen. And he's always had that big smile on his face. He's always kind of had that temperament that, that draw, that drew people to him and, and just a good kid, a hard worker and somebody that you're proud to see succeed. And, and really, you know, I haven't seen a player, that has been embraced by our fan base like this in, in a really long time. I mean, you know, everybody loved Mason Jones, uh, you know, loved Moses, uh, lo loved some other guys here in, in recent history. Ronnie Brewer was, but I haven't seen a guy that the fan base, you know, from top to bottom just absolutely loves like, like yeah. we all love Jalen Williams. I mean, he's, he has just absolutely done something this season uh, not only from his play, but but in how he carries himself that that's unmatched in recent Razorback history. So a couple more quick ones for you. I mentioned Joe Johnson, one of the greats. I think he's whatever you want to say, top three, Sidney, Corliss, Joe. Um, what made Joe Johnson different in as his approach to basketball in college? I'm, I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna steal a quote from Coach Richardson. I know Joe doesn't like this, but Joe's not great at anything. Now he became great, and I saw Joe in, in the one on one. But he is really good at everything. Yeah, um, he is such a skilled, cerebral basketball player. And you know, I I, I grew up playing AAU ball against Joe. Um, didn't really, you, you know, when you're playing against somebody like that, you, you don't guard them straight up. But man, when you're on the same team, you're playing pickup every day. Your garden. Nobody wanted to guard him in practice. I had to guard him a lot. It didn't go well ever. Uh, I think I said the word help quite. I was like somebody getting mugged in an alley on a regular basis. I'm just screaming help. It, it, he's just so smooth and so cerebral. He doesn't get too high or too low. But right. the thing that separated Joe is, is he had a lot of God-given ability. Uh, he had size. You know, he had that court vision. He, uh, Joe worked his butt off. I mean, yeah. all Joe would do is basketball. A lot of people don't realize dude was a gym rat. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't out on Dixon Street. I can promise you I checked every place on Dixon Street to see if he was there. He was not. Um, he was either playing video games or he was in the gym. Yeah. And he loved basketball, and that's all he wanted to do. Joe is – I'm 41. Joe's about to be 41. Um, he, you know, he's, he's posting these pictures doing hot yoga – with his shirt off. Oh, Blake, he's still he ready to go. He played in the NBA this year. He played in the uh, NBA this season. Blake. I would sign him. Uh, he, I would sign him. It's, it's, it's what he does, and he he's just a special player. He averaged about 16 points a game 
uh, in two seasons at Arkansas, our freshman and sophomore year, we were in the same class. Joe could have averaged 30 in a sleep if he wanted to, yeah. but when Joe was taking it to the basket, he would see you at his peripheral vision. If you had a shot that was 5% better than his, you got the ball. You didn't just get the ball, you got it on time. You got it in right. the shooter's pocket. You got it stepping into that pass, and he was just such a – now, we'd get in the huddle, and I would yell, Joe, quit pay, even if it's to me, don't pass it, shoot the ball. You know, we're we're – we're, we're, we're trying and, and he would wake up and he would he would run on an you know eight point run but but he is cerebral and he works so 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 hard well, Blake, that's what that's so like i i don't know if joe likes it but that's why i hate that nickname iso joe because it doesn't explain he is a pass first guard and when he got those max deals in atlanta everybody looked at him like joe you're supposed to score 30. But if you watch Joe Johnson play, he can score, but what he does is make the right play. So he's drawing a double team. Now he's kicking it. You're going to make the right play. I think that's something that Joe, like, I think he's one of the, like, even better because he knows how to play the game. And he is, like, the well, first time I played against him, like, the dude was coming into college. We were just working out at the gym. I, I very rarely saw the body control in the ball handling skills, like his body control with at six foot seven. And, is and he, rare. And he, was, he was a big wiry kind of flowy six foot seven too. And, and, you know, you could, you could chicken wing those guys if they were coming through the lane and, and, but, but he, he had that center of gravity and, and he found I mean, a way to kind of slice and dice and cut it in diagonal ways before the Euro step and, and things were really happening. He, he just always found that opening he had a soft touch around the basket, and and if you had a slightly better shot, he got it to you. Every you got you. Time. Let me let me ask you this: um, What do you what have you observed about the NIL over the last whatever it's been five months, six months? I don't know how long, eight months maybe. What what have um, anything alarming? You've seen just good things. What, what kind of you taken from it so far? I mean, nothing alarming. I mean, it, I've, it's been interesting to hear folks. Uh, you know, a couple college football teams had great classes and people were up in arms that they spent X or, oh, my God, every offensive lineman's getting this. It, it, if they were creating apps and somebody wanted to invest in their app, nobody would be upset. I mean, right. I, it, it's it's we're right on the front end of it. It's kind of the Wild West right now. Um, different states, you know, depending on the law in that state are slightly different. I mean, I think Alabama had to tweak their law and go back in to the legislature and tweak their law because they left something out that other states had in. And, and I, I think we're going to get a more uniform deal, but they're all pretty close to each other. I haven't seen anything alarming. I, I think for it, it was a lot easier for schools that had – it was a lot easier for schools that were basically already doing NIL deals. <laughs> um, and they were able to kind of flip the switch and, right. and you know, run it in a different way. Um, but you know, I, I think it's good. I think if done correctly, you, you're going to be able to help some kids from situations where, and, and you knew guys like this, when you played, they'd get their Pell grant and they'd send it all home, but, but, you know, three, $400. And then that's what they had for four months, four months, Pat. And yeah. now it's a situation where, you know, if you work hard and take care of yourself and, and they know if you get in trouble off the court, you're going to lose these. I, I think that there are good things about this. I think there are guys that and girls that are going to lose focus because they've got all the things that they think they're rich because they've got $50,000 that they've made this year and don't realize that's something to build on going forward. But, but I think it's a good thing. I, I know part of this at every school, Arkansas has done a great job with it. They're, they're teaching financial management and financial literacy to go along with it. So, so there are some great, great things that are happening with it. There are obviously going to be some pitfalls. And as new as it is, we're going to hear about it as it works itself out. Uh, but but I, I, I think it's a good thing. It's, it's obviously here to stay. You, you can't put the genie back in the bottle now. And it, it's, it's something that, that's going to help a lot of kids and a lot of families that otherwise would have this opportunity. And look, this is America. This is America. If you have a God-given gift that you work hard to develop in any other field, 
you're allowed to be compensated for that, especially if they're going to use your, you know, NIL again is name, image, and likeness. Right. If somebody's going to use your name, image, and likeness, you can get compensated for it. So for the NCAA to catch up with with the rest of the world, uh, especially with the United States of America, is a is a very, very good thing. All right, here's my last thing for you because – you were on a team that did something that no other team has done, not even national championship team. You guys um, went into the SEC tournament and you won it all. What do you what what was the mentality going to that tournament? I think you guys were were a bubble team. Was that fair to say? Fair. On the and wrong side. We were on the wrong side of the bubble, but we were wrong a bubble side. Team. And and so what do you think happened there? Like was it a to, I mean, because to win the tournament, to win, did you guys win three? And I'm trying to look at it now. We won, we won four games in four days. I know what happened with us. Uh, with, with with about two weeks left in the season, Coach Richardson showed up to practice one day and said, Hey, guys, we're not getting the NCAA tournament unless we probably went out and then win, you know, two, three, four. You know, we probably need to win the SEC tournament. So we're starting a new season. And with, I think, three or four games left in the year, we started two a days, Pat. Um, oh, really? Yeah, you, this was it. Yeah. I mean, naturally, great time of the year. Let, let's start doing two a days. Let's, let's just start, let's run this over. Let's start let's over. Kick your butts and 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 you know this, Coach Richardson. Two a days are not what you see today. I mean, they were brutal. You're yeah. there at six a.m. You do that. You go to class. You're coming back that afternoon for more. Um, but but it was the focus every day at those practices. It was, hey, we've got Auburn or we've got Kentucky or we've got so and so coming up. But this is for the SEC tournament, and, and we're 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 gonna pull it out of y'all, whether you know you have it or not, from the depths of your soul, in a way that in a way that only Nolan Richardson can convince you or scare you or push you uh, to that point. Because of that, we we did pretty well at the end of the year. Uh, we we came really close to to beating a really good Kentucky team. Uh, we beat a very good Auburn team. Chris Porter had gotten in trouble, I think maybe some interactions with an agent or something in Auburn. Mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, but he was not allowed to play. But that team still had Doc Robinson, Mamadou Njai, Mac McGadney. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a strong, you know, Scotty Pullman, our guy. Uh, that, yeah. was, that was a strong Auburn team. We were able to beat them in Fayetteville, uh, go on to the SEC tournament with some momentum. And, and, and you know this in any tournament setting, but especially one and done, you got to get the first one. And if you can play well in the first one, it gives you that confidence going forward. Uh, we were able to beat a very, very good Kentucky team in the second round. Coach Richardson called me uh, yesterday morning. He heard I was in town. He was just checking in, and he wanted to talk about Kentucky games that we had. And uh, I told him I remembered that Kentucky game. We, we beat them pretty handily. Uh, we knew with about ten minutes, we we just we we jumped them early. Um, they hit a three at the buzzer. I think they had 68 or 69 points. They hit a three at the buzzer, and Coach was pissed. He was <laughs> mad that they broke that. He never wanted anybody to score 70 points. He said, man, if they were – but he was mad, and instead of enjoying that game, he walks down to shake his good friend Tubby Smith's hand, and he's pissed off, and Tubby's looking at him like, you just kicked my butt. Like, what are you mad about? Right. That uh, From a great game and a huge win, my memory is Coach being mad that we let him score 70 points. <laughs> All right. But went on and beat an LSU team with Strub Miles Swift. Jabari Smith Sr. Mm, uh, was yeah. on that team, a heck of a player, uh, yeah. a good team, and then and then turn around and beat that Auburn team again in the championship game. But you just get that momentum and ride that wave. And and fortunately for us, our wave included uh, future phenom Joe Johnson and, and Brandon Dean was red hot. Teddy Gibson had a great tournament. T.J. Cleveland – Played great on an almost broken ankle. It was my fault in practice for diving around and acting stupid. But we had some guys that stepped up in key moments. And Coach Richardson, you know, knew and, and had us prepared in a way that, that I don't think any team from a conditioning and mentality standpoint that, that had to win four games in four days has ever gone into the SEC tournament ready to play. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I think that just lends to how Coach Richardson – like he he could read he reads people as well as anybody ever that ever lived and, and sort of understood how to get that out of you. All right, my last one, Coach Musselman. I think it's fair. I mean, he's done a fantastic job. Um, what he's a unique guy, the energy and everything he does. What is he? What does he hit on? That that's gotten 
uh, obviously, you know, he, he knows how to manage the, the transfers. One of the things they said, well, he's re- high school recruiting. Well, he's done that. Um, what do you think it is that's, that's allowed him to have the quick success since he's gone on campus? You know, first of all, he, he grew up, you know, with, with, a, with a hell of a mentor with his father and Bill Musselman, you know, a guy that really thought outside the box and, and found different ways to win, coached at every level. Um, and and had experiences that other coaches don't have. Usually you're a high school coach or you're a former college player that you get on as a GA and then you kind of move up the ranks. Uh, Musk coached all kind of semi-pro. He's coached in the NBA. He's been a general manager, you know, in what was then basically the G League. I can't remember what it was, what it was called at the time. AB, it wasn't the ABA. Uh, EBA, the old CBA. He's had a lot of different experiences. And yeah. he's to the point in his life that he's been able to reflect upon those experiences and then put it all together in, in kind of a casserole. And he, he works it in a, in a different way. And, and Pat, look, in the history of Arkansas sports, Arkansas Razorback sports, the coaches with the most success have found a different way to skin the cat. It, it, it's yeah. not some of these other schools where you can just go pluck the McDonald's All-Americans left. Front. John McDonald, you know, the all-time greatest coach in NCAA history in any sport, you know, when every other track coach in America was going after sprinters, John McDonald went and got distance runners from overseas to come to Arkansas and run. You know, Eddie Sutton played different. Nolan Richardson definitely played different. Lou Holtz had great success at Arkansas. Um, he has found a way to take a lot of different things from, from the way he markets himself and the program. Uh, I don't, you know, th- there's not a day that goes by that he's not dreaming up new ways to market the program. Uh, you're, you're seeing stuff inside the locker room you've never seen before. Uh, you know, the man is at every major concert uh, within five hours. Um, I don't know how he has the energy to do it. And then on top of that, he eats, breathes, and sleeps basketball. Yeah. That's all he does. It's all he wants to do. It's all he cares about. If you see him somewhere that he doesn't have to have some kind of a suit on, he's wearing Arkansas Razorback basketball gear. That's all he cares about. That's all he wants to do. And, and, and when you approach it like that, you know, he's got folks doing the analytics stuff. He's, he's, he's got Keith Smart, a former, you know, NBA head coach and great player uh, on the staff. And, and they've taken all these numbers and experiences and marketing and just an absolute voracious passion for the game and, and put it into one thing. And, and it's, it's, it's been interesting. See, you've been to some practices. I mean, the, the way they approach practice is unlike anything I've ever seen. I've, I've taken, you know, business leaders in this state or other friends to see it and, and former college players too, and they're blown away and, and they take things away from it. And, and it's just a different way to approach basketball. Uh, we're sure happy to have him. Uh, it, it's, been a, uh, it's been a fun ride to watch how he's tinkered and turned this season around. And, and we look forward to having having coach for a long, long time. I'm amazed at your energy. I don't know how you do it. What do you have? Ten kids now? <laughs> I know you made me think about it. I was doing. I have I have three. It feels like ten sometimes for for Lauren because I'm here doing podcasts with you while she takes <laughs> three kids. She's like, she's like, yeah. You're like, yeah no, I told her. I said, I said I'm, I'm gonna be home a little late. I've got a podcast with Pat, and she goes, "Well, that'll be one in the morning because y'all are gonna talk." <laughs> Well, brother, I appreciate it. You know, I love you. And uh, thank you for coming on, taking some time. Give the baby girls a hug and Lauren a hug. And, and hopefully we'll see you soon, my man. I, I, I love you too. You know that. And we look forward to you. Need, I, I know you got to work. You need to bring the bride to a Razorback. Come to football season. Come to the football game. We, we want to see... We want to see the woman that married Pat Bradley. The, the, the Arkansas world is dying to see the woman that married Pat Bradley. I'm so ready. I'm going to come for a baseball game. Good. Right? We're going to turn this in the springtime. We've, we've, we've got you taken care of. We've got, we'll have a suite ready for you. And, um, and you can stay there, and I will take her around and introduce yeah. her. <laughs> Happily. All right, brother. Appreciate it, man. Thank right. you. Take care. All right. Thanks, Blake, brother. Mm-hmm.